Welcome all to this morning's learning exchange, Councils and COVID, Lessons from the Year of Discontent. My name is Mark Blanchard. I'm the Public Sector Director for GovNews, and I'll be facilitating today's event. This webinar will contain relevant, resourceful and valuable discussions with the ambition to help shape your digital work practices for a more effective and efficient future. We're going to explore topics from our recent public sector research, uh, specifically how COVID-19 has, um, has impacted remote working, uh, areas like employee wellbeing, communications, and the organization's use of emerging technology to improve processes and the adoption of automation. We have uh, five speakers joining us today. Uh, these are Raj Mack, Head of Business Engagement for Information Technology and Digital Services at Birmingham City Council. From Swindon Borough Council, we have Phil Merkin, the Head of Digital and Business Change. And Phil's going to be joined by Councillor Robert Jandy, who is the Cabinet Member for Organisational Excellence. At Thanet District Council, we have Joe Brackenborough, who's the Digital Transformation Manager. And from Ring Central, we have Gareth Johns, uh, the Senior Vertical Director. Now, before I hand over to our speakers, the usual housekeeping, all attendees are going to remain on listen-only mode throughout today's learning exchange. Uh, we welcome your comments and questions throughout the webinar. You don't have to wait till the end to post these. Uh, feel free to post them in the private questions tab on the control panel. Uh, we're going to try and cover as many as, of these as possible during the time that we have left available in the Q&A section. Um, if we don't have time to cover your question or comment, then those not answered will be forwarded to our speakers for a uh, direct response. Uh, we're recording today's session, so a copy of the uh, learning exchange will be sent over to you with additional collateral, and that will be made available to you afterwards. Therefore, we are keeping it strictly to the discussions and the Q&A, and you may be glad to know that you're not going to hear a single next slide, please. So without any further delay, may I now hand over to Gareth and Joe to get started. Thank you. Hello, I'm, I'm Gareth Johns from Ring Central. I have responsibility for looking after our approach to vertical solutions, and I'm pleased to be joined by Joe Brackenborough, who's the Digital Transformation Manager at Thanet District Council. Um, Joe, really pleased that you can join us here um, today. Um, I wonder if I could just ask you to give a little bit of uh, an introduction about yourself and you know the work that you do at, um, at Thanet, or, or should I call you TDC? What's the right abbreviation? I think TDC is good for us, but um, being in digital or ICT, we have loads of abbreviations, but TV, TDC is good. <laughs> Fan it's good. I've heard some uh, really lovely ways of saying it as well, like tain it. That could be nice, <laughs> but it is fun it. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, as you mentioned, you are the digital transformation uh, manager there at, at Thanet. Um, so, well, let's understand a, a little bit more about you know, your about you, your role, um, and, and then also if you can kind of expand into um, you know, for those of us who don't know about Thanet, yep. actually, you know, yes, you're a district council, but but tell us all the things that we don't know about Thanet. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So my role as the digital transformation manager, um, I'm in charge of the digital transformation across the whole council. And as part of our remit, we also do digital training. Um, we are also in charge of central administration of our corporate systems, um, customer engagement uh, via our digital platforms, such as the digital experience platform that we've got, also our website and our online forms. I'm also in charge of a, our GIS system, which is our geographical um, information system. I'm also in charge of the LLPG system which is our local land and property gazetteer system. And I'm also in charge of uh, corporate uh, performance reporting as well. So uh, I don't want to brag, but uh, it's a lovely. So, so, yeah, lovely. It's not, <laughs> not much on your plate then. No, no, I don't, I don't get many meetings, so <laughs> it should be fine. So, okay. Um, yeah, so go on, sorry, carry on, carry on about, about yeah, Thanos itself gonna, then. I was just going to say, um, I think uh, a lot of us, uh, uh, in local councils probably do have a lot of different job roles put on 
onto our descriptions um, and I'm not a master of all of them. I have a team. Um, but yeah, it, it's fun to have a, a wide range of different things to look at because you can be working on something different every day. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. Uh, and coming back to now, um, I'm fortunate enough to know that I know where Thanet is. So for, for those who may not know, actually geographically, where is Thanet? What's important about it? So Thanet is um, in the uh, southeast of England. It's right at the end. Maybe we'll cut to a map, but um, it's right at the end of the country. And um, it is located in Kent, which you might know as, uh, I believe, the Garden of England. Um, and it's famous for seaside uh, holidays to Margate Beach um, or even uh, Del Boy and Rodney uh, come down to the Margate Beach. That's probably one of our claim to fame. We also have the only uh, Royal Harbour, which is located in Ramsgate, which is really lovely. Um, we have 19 miles of uh, stunning coastline as well. Um, and we are the closest sandy beach to the capital. So, yeah, so we, we have some claims to fame. Um, we've got a population of about 141,000 people as well. So they're the people we serve in our district. Um, and while our district is is a coastal town, we do have some pockets of uh, significant um, depravity and um, in our district, which can make our different areas. Um, it can make it difficult because we do have areas where we have to accommodate very differently to other areas. So we take it all case by case basis of the different areas. OK. And as a as a local council, um, our key areas that we we manage are housing, planning, building control, waste and recycling is in house. Um, it's normally something that's outsourced in local councils, but it's in house on ours. And as mentioned before, we run our local port and our harbour. Right. So as you say, usual kind of aspects of a district council with a little yep. bit more as well. OK, so if we kind of you know, look <laughs> Look back at the past year and, and, and what a year it's been. Um, you know, local for, local authorities have been absolutely at the front line uh, of part of the you know, pandemic response, um, as well as being affected by it you know, as organisations themselves. So one of the things that I kind of like to explore with you, Joe, are, uh, are three areas, actually, um, to understand how Thanet has kind of responded you know, during this past year. So I'll kind of tee them up just to give you time to think about them. Um, so first yeah. of all, I kind of like to look at um, how uh, how this has impacted citizens in, in terms of how you responded to to serving citizens. Um, then secondly, the impact on staff, because yeah, obviously you know, they have been impacted. Um, and then the final bit will be around um, you know, the business of the council, actually making sure that the democratic process has kind of continued you know, whilst we've been in this situation. So. Um, some you know, three quite chunky topics to go out there, mm. so um, hopefully I won't <laughs> overwhelm you too much. But uh, yeah, if I can you know, ask you to, uh, you know, to to share your stories about you know, what what has, uh, what has been done in Thanet during the past year. Yeah, I think um, from the citizen uh, side of things, it's obviously been quite uh, difficult for them. I think we we normally have a face to face. Um, a, you know, facility for people to come in, talk to the council, um, you know, and, and that's quite reassuring for someone that, um, you know, has a problem with council tax or, or benefits or, or, or something that they um, need. So we've had to kind of ramp up our digital services so that we can kind of provide that reassurance and that sort of quick way of talking to us and, um, yeah, the ability to have some reassurance. We've obviously got the telephone um, call centre as well. So that's obviously being used a lot more than our face to face. Um, but I believe our face to faces are also uh, getting more people in now, now that we're doing COVID safe and, and stuff like that. From our um, digital perspective as, as our team, one of the things that we did was we massively changed our website and changed its focus completely. So if you go to our website even now, um, the first thing you're going to get is uh, the COVID stats of the FANA area. You're going to get information on how to keep safe as an individual and you're going to get relevant information from the government. So we've had to change um, our focus of our website really so we can get as much information out there to people to keep them safe and uh, 
also to make them aware of the situation that's out there. Um, I think that was kind of the biggest thing that uh, that we did um, is is to kind of change all our communications and the way we focused on about helping people. Um, I know Joe, can, can, can I ask you a question there yeah. around around that change that you've made? So um, I would expect that you know there was that initial you know, you know, rush, as it were, you know, to change, you know, to make information available. Um, what kind of feedback did you get from the user community, you know, from your citizens, in, in terms of actually this is you know, this is you know, this is great, this is right, this is the information that I want, or actually this is kind of missing. So uh, I'm expecting that, that you had some kind of iterations, or did you hit upon the magic combination you know, right from the outset? Oh, I think um, I, I'm going to say we hit the magic straight away, but. Um, no, I think I think there was some changing, and we've gone through um, the start, which was very much just about explaining the situation, to now what you might call an invasive pop up, so that as soon as you go to our website, it's now there, and that's the first thing. So we did change from being a bit more subtle to being well, actually, this is really serious now, and although it's a maybe invasive, it's a little bit stronger word, but. Um, but it's there. As soon as you go straight on, you get this COVID pop up um, that tells you all about, um, you know, the stats and, and the figures. And our even our front page will have COVID information about there uh, as well, and about our services and and about about how to keep safe. Um, and I think that's the the, the changes that we did. Um, whereas normally our website would be about more. Uh, topical about either elections on the first page if it was election time or um, you know planning which is a, bit, a big thing that people come to our website for or paying bills and, and that so we've really kind of changed the focus on it. And, and how quickly did you make those kind of changes? Um, it, it was pretty much immediate. Um, as part of digital, we come under um, the communications. So uh, my director is a director of uh, communications and digital. Um, so we are hugely linked in. Um, so, yeah, pretty much the digital communications officer who's uh, in charge of the website pretty much started putting stuff up as soon as we could, really. So um, it's quite a good combination of having communications and digital together. I'm not sure if it's uh, the most usual uh, combined of services, but it, it works really well. And, and just to stay with this before we kind of move on to, uh, to aspects around staff, were there any new services or new capabilities that you had to put on there? Uh, you know, because you, you talked about you know, some changes to you know, you know transactions and so on. Um, were, were there any that um, had a particularly kind of big uptake? So I think um, maybe one of the, the changes that we, we had is that we, each service uh, was looking at how they can continue their job um, to the public and give the service to the public, but do it in a COVID safe way. Um, one of the things that um, they, one of the teams changed, and just one example off the top of my head, um, is the hygiene inspections for food. Uh, so anywhere that prepares food as a local council, we must inspect their property. And I, I personally worked with the um, the lead on that in that area. And basically, we came up with um, some forms, uh, some Google forms, because we are a Google house um, here and we love Google. Um, so we came up with some Google forms for people to submit their uh, pictures and data and we also um, enabled uh, Google Meet so that they could send an appointment to the person that needs their property inspected and they could go around with their mobile phone and show them how um, you know their fridge or uh, certain areas are um, so that they could do that re um, inspection and uh, continue to do those inspections even in COVID uh, lockdown. Uh, that, that, again that's, that's a great example of it. Is it... Um, it's an element of kind of digital transformation, but okay, I'm kind of stretching the analogy there. But again, probably yeah. more, probably more a case of actually, uh, as you described, adaptation to a situation using the tool sets that you had kind of available, and you know, surfacing it in, in a in a format that was you know, user friendly and not kind of scary for people to engage with. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's what you know, moving on to staff, like that's kind of what all the staff have been doing at the council. We have over um, 460 uh, employees across uh, 
you know, our council, including a lot of them that are not digital. Um, they don't use digital every day. So we have a lot of operational staff um, like our um, what we would call BIM men, but are refuse collectors now. Um, and obviously their day to day job isn't uh, using computers. Um, so they've had to make changes as well um, in a different way, which maybe I haven't been involved in because I'm uh, the digital manager. But um, yeah, we've all had to kind of adapt our processes and use what we've got. And so, so in, in terms of because we're, we're we're on to the second of those uh, of those three um, you know, challenges yeah. that I gave you. So as far as the transition around staff, as you mentioned, you know, close to five hundred staff. Obviously, not everybody who you know, would normally kind of be working um, in a, in a you know, technology or kind of online environment. But for for those that that were, you know, the traditional um, you know uh, office based workers, what has you know what's the transition been like for them? What's been the impact there? Has that has this been something that's been you know, difficult to achieve? or not so um from a digital point of view of my team obviously we were uh, i'd like to say quite nice in the transition and it and it worked really well um what we've been doing pre uh covid or any of that is that we've kind of been working towards although we didn't do a lot of remote working um we've been working towards putting technology in place to enable remote working because we saw that as the future in the next five, you know, even 10 years for the council. Um, I know the uh, public um, sector um, uh, sort of are normally behind private sector. So companies um, have probably been doing remote working for years and years, but as a local council, it's not something that was on our priority list. We have a big building. We kind of all turn up to the building. But what we've been doing in the background is um, we changed everyone over to Chromebooks. We um, we moved everyone away from Windows, um, as I say, to Chromebooks. We also moved away from Microsoft Office and moved to Google G Suite and uh, Gmail, Calendar and all those things. Um, and we started moving our corporate systems into the cloud so that we could access them anywhere. So when COVID kind of hit, I think as a council, um, there really wasn't panic, but there was kind of worry, like, is this going to work from home? You know, how are we going to manage stuff? And it almost went from us normally uh, booking a meeting room and all going into a meeting room to then the next day we all just went on a Google Hangout, uh, Google Meet, probably was Hangout then, it's changed names. But uh, yeah, we all went on to a Google Meet and and just started doing that. And it's kind of um, spiralled and people now love doing stuff from home. They love working from home. It's kind of changed our fears of, of, of remote working um, and that actually people still work when they're at home and they work just as hard sometimes even even more hours than that they would normally put in um, because there's no travel. Um, so it did switch. And I think digital were key in that because the first thing we did was as a team was stop what we're doing project wise and kind of run as many training sessions or as guidance sessions or Q&A sessions, um, you know, drop in sessions. We pretty much one of us was always on call that you could drop in and ask a question of digital, like, how do I do this on Gmail? Or how am I scanning stuff in now? Or because um, I don't have a scanner at home or, you know, and kind of answering those questions and putting out FAQs. Um, but to be perfectly honest, the staff kind of did really well. And um, it did uh, yeah, come natural. That, 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 that's excellent to hear. Uh, as you say, you'd already put the foundation elements in there. Uh, by going cloud first, cloud native to make that transition easier. So you know, from a, from a, an education around the tool set, kind of less so, more a case of actually you know, education around you know the you know, cultural change, how they may you know, how to adapt to kind of working from home. And again, mm. you know, that's that's really encouraging to to hear because um, I, I've heard stories, and I'm sure you have, of, of around organisations that when they made the first shift, they had to ramp up your VPN capability because um, 
you know, it, you know they weren't used to having so many people working from home the issues that that that, that brought mm -hmm. in sometimes you know the, the platforms that people were using meant that they couldn't actually have video meetings because that would saturate you know the vpn aspect but again you kind of preempted that um by making that transition so that's that's you know it's really kind of interesting to hear now something else that i kind of un that i was kind of uh, um a little bird kind of told me was around uh, what you've been doing with kind of council meetings so do you want to uh, you know, yeah. kind of steer you into that yeah, so in terms of keeping our council business kind of up and running, um, obviously, uh, as a council, we have meetings um, with councillors. So councillors have public meetings um, to make decisions on on council uh, issues and, and budget and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, one of the things that you have to do as a council is allow people to be able to view those meetings and be open and transparent. Um, so we were we were pretty pretty hot on it actually um and uh, if i haven't met before we if i haven't said before we're actually quite a poor council um so we decided that we would use some open source software we've obviously used what we've already got which is google meet so get all the councillors on uh, a google meeting we would um get our democratic services staff to kind of coordinate and help with the um uh, the councillors and how the meeting will be um, will be managed because it's very different to having a physical meeting. We would stream them on uh, YouTube and that's where the open source software came in because basically we recorded the Google Meet, streamed it to um, to YouTube so that anyone can view our our um, our videos live, um, which is which is fantastic. And I think um that was a big change and i know that we helped other councils with that as well um so other councils did ask us you know how are you doing that because we're having to stop meetings whereas our luckily our democratic services team were really up for kind of doing the digital virtual way of um of doing meetings and actually because people could join at home the councillors could join at home because most of our councillors work um you know they could join in on sessions. So the attendance of councillors went up. Um, I We used to record them and I used to record them um, at the start. So I used to listen in and I always used to hear really good things about, um, oh, this is very good, isn't it? I like these meetings. And it's just really lovely to hear that the councillors actually really enjoyed it. Um, there are public meetings as well. Um, and people didn't have to come to the office to, to speak in those public meetings like licensing. Um, so they were able to join from the comfort of their home as well, um, which was really lovely as well. You say that that, that, trans, that transition, and again, I know that, that lots of uh, councils have have gone through this. They've, they've had to, they, you know they've had to find different ways of doing it. But again, yeah. really impressive to hear how how you've done that. And um, I kind of wonder two things. One, did it help in terms of keeping meetings running to time? But you don't necessarily need to kind of answer that. Um, but the second bit was it would be is this something do you think you kind of um, you, that you've pivoted that you've made a transition that actually you know when situations kind of, kind of does get back to something like a you know, relative you know normal that that mm. this will continue to to happen um, and that actually you know, rather than people you know coming to to the council offices that they, they'll be kind of brought in online for for sessions as well yeah so uh, one of the so in terms of I think keeping people uh, keeping the agenda um, as short as possible, I think yeah they do they do kind of keep the the thing rolling. Um, it seems to flow so much better as well. Um, you don't get as many interruptions, um, and I think generally our meetings are much more precise. There's almost no editing of uh, the videos uh, before they go out. Um, like we don't need to cut any big pauses or anything like that out. Not that we would edit any talking out, but we normally edit pauses or where there's connection problems. So yeah, they're, it's generally really good on 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 that on that thing. We, in terms of um, the way forward, yeah, our democratic services team are, are, are they they like it. They they see it. The councillors like it. I think the obstacle is is the government rules around um, whether you can have a virtual only meeting uh, after this um, i know that in parliament they they went back to having physical meetings and going into parliament for me it would be really lovely if the go government just said yep 
you can have virtual meetings. You don't have to physically all be at one place uh, to have a meeting. And in preparation of that, um, the Democratic Services Manager and, and my team kind of went into the offices, COVID safe, um, and, uh, and kind of set up our, um, we've got a camera system and we've got a computer that controls it. And again, because, you know, we've got no money, there's the little violin out again. And um, we built an actual free way of um, being able to join the camera system up as a person on uh, Google Meet. So uh, what we do is we join and the camera system, even though there's multiple people sitting in, in, in the council chamber, it actually uh, looks like one person and it focuses in on them. Um, so we've already kind of built that hybrid way of working. So that That's if brilliant. They, half the councillors want to stay virtual, half the councillors still want to come in, we can we can have half on the virtual at home and half in the council chamber. So we kind of already started that work and, oh. and successfully did it, which is good. Uh, yeah, even better say that it's been a, su <laughs> a success. Now, I, I'm kind of mindful that we've got um, more people, uh, some, some you know, other great speakers, um, on the webinar. So just yep. as we kind of get closer to wrapping up, um, I'll, 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 something that, that's kind of struck me from everything that, you, that you've that kind of thought through, Joe, is that actually you can, you kind of, Thanet has really embraced as part of its digital journey, has embraced that aspect of cloud first. And uh, as you say, your transformation was, was ha already happening. So you really had got the foundations in place, which you know, helped you both be very quick in terms of responding to how you needed to, to change and provide services to, to citizens. You know, make it easy for your staff to you know uh, to transition and kind of work from home um and then as you've just been describing you know, keeping the process of democracy going so okay for 2021 that's going to be feet up then you know there's surely there's nothing left for you to do is there or, or, or what what's next on your roadmap for this year yeah so um I, I think it's fair to say that there's uh pockets that we still need to work on our big thing um and our next big project um which is how we we got introduced um, is uh, our telephony system is currently on premise. Um, we really want to move that to a cloud based system, um, which is our mantra. Um, we've luckily found someone fantastic, Ring Central, and um, and that is our next our next big project is to kind of move that to keep conditioning, uh, to keep pushing in the direction of um, our other great product, which is Okta, which Ring Central integrates with, and to, to move people so that they can have uh, a telephone system, which is not, you know, pick up the phone, it's on your desk, it's kind of have it on your mobile, have it on your Chromebook, um, you know, you can message on it, you can receive faxes from it, you can receive text messages through it. It's to kind of enable that remote working uh, telephony and at the moment, our telephony platform is very much a traditional on-premise one. And we need to, because telephone is, is kind of the backbone of the council, um, especially where people can't come in face to face. So we really need to transition into so that people can work from home, like I'm doing now, and still take the calls as if I was in the office with the same level of service and, you know, um, that same great um, experience for the customer. Mm. But I think as you, as you just kind of touched upon there, there Joe, that uh, despite all the plethora of digital channels and the growth in digital channels, you know, telephony or voice is still kind of king around that. So, um, yeah. again, Joe, thank you very much for you know for sharing you know, the details of the work that you that you've been doing uh, at at, uh, at Thanet, and um, you know, great to hear that we're part of the, the future. So, once again, thank you very much for joining us. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, back to you, Mark. Thank you, Gareth and Joe, for sharing that insight. We've had uh, a number of uh, comments and questions already come in, uh, so we're going to um, uh, no doubt come back to you later on. Um, now over to our next uh, discussion uh, and indeed presentation uh, for today. I'm going to hand over to uh, Swindon Borough Council. So, like I said, we've got Phil Merkin, Head of Digital and Business Change, and Councillor Robert Chandy. Cabinet member for organizational excellence. Over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, my name's Phil Merkin. I'm the head of uh, digital and business change at Swindon Borough Council. And uh, 
want to start with wow what a year it's um it's almost exact, almost exactly a year to the day since um since we did a what if exercise a business continuity exercise um around a, an emerging pandemic that was coming out of china and was in italy at the time and you know we uh, we looked at how we would respond if it came to the uk and, and um, that's probably one of the most um productive uh, what if business continuity exercises I think I've ever been involved in in the past uh, and was really helpful I think we we did that exercise back in January 2020 now and um, identified immediately some of the quick things that we might need to do in terms of laptop stock um, hardware um, and in terms of some of our project prioritization which then very quickly came into effect and, and really helped us so uh, going through the timeline really as part of the first lockdown the priority for us in terms of technology was all the working from home type solutions a lot of these were projects that were, were already underway in the council but um, we prioritized them and gave them a bit of acceleration so uh, contact center telephony microsoft teams always on vpn they'll be synonymous now around all your organizations as projects you've, you've all delivered or been part of or, or heard part of um, e-signatures digital mail room all those types of things were were what we delivered way back in sort of um, sort of april but as well as that when i reflect on it we were also heavily involved in supporting the redeployment of staff into priority services we had our own major projects which we were able to keep running at the same time they're a little bit like oil tankers to turn those around so I implemented a children's social care uh, system in the middle of a pandemic was a massive achievement for the council and we still managed to progress our big hr organization wide projects during that period um, the thing for me that is kind of the the icing on top of the cake, the cherry, so to speak, is is our our use of emerging technology during this period. We we dabbled in some emerging technology in the past, but it really came into its own as start as uh, the start of the pandemic. So uh, we used some artificial intelligence and, mach and machine learning to help with our fly tipping response when a household waste recycling centre closed. Um, we were able to get something up and running really quickly where residents could take pictures of fly tipping and the artificial intelligence could then um, get a longitude and latitude and exact location for that photo it could then also estimate the type of material the weight the size of the material so we could respond appropriately with the right vehicle and that was so key in kind of reducing our turnaround times from about 10 days to four days and the response to that was really positively received and again we did some real emerging technology stuff around our free school meals so we introduced um, robotic process automation that meant applications could be processed 24 7 that resulted in a quicker turnaround time for eligible um, eligible residents and information to schools and a 98 percent efficiency we achieved on that process so you know i think emerging technology really came into its own in the last year and provided us with some real benefits on business problems come sort of may june time we were able to finally take stock and reflect on what would happen what had worked well and um, and used a lot of information then to build up our programs for the future so we surveyed all our staff on what on what they thought uh, had worked well for them and what didn't um, digital literacy was a big theme that came out that a lot of them felt were improved but some people needed more help and guidance on that journey and we built a program called modern efficient effective and it had the had the strands of kind of estates our workforce how we can better support our workforce adapt to this way of working in the future about our existing capabilities and new technology capabilities we could bring into the organization and that was one, one strand we did the other thing we did was really start ramping up our citizen engagement to understand what they wanted what they'd experienced during this period and there's some research from pendulum media and ring central that i've read recently that shows that 70 two percent of local government respondents say the pandemic has increased their use of the communication platform with citizens and we very much use this as part of our pandemic response and our adaptation to what our citizens wanted so a great example is we use some sentiment analysis uh, that really told us a lot of our residents that we wanted to target we're using things like facebook and social media and so our comms team 
Um, they changed their approach. They developed lots of social media friendly type tools and we had a massive amount of success from a Facebook Q&A session with our director of public health, some two way comms where people could um, use Facebook to ask questions and that's even now been extended to Great Western Hospital have come and joined us on those Facebook QAs so you know really proud of how we responded to that. In the middle of the summer then there was a gradual return to work the focus was very much from a digital perspective on um, on desk bookings and COVID safety risk assessments and how those were being managed uh, and then the second lockdown came and the technology didn't change too much. Very much uh, health and well-being was the response and the primary thing to do around there. We're now at the, at the moment in, in lockdown number three and I think my reflection is this, is this one's proven hardest from a technology point of view. Some of the implementations in lockdown one that I've previously referred to, the niggles that we um, that were in there um, are becoming to great a little bit and some of the things are having to be uh, reconfigured or re-architected a little bit um, because we're adapting to a new normal this is not a, you know emergency change you put it in you get it over the line but when it becomes a little bit more permanent sometimes you have to re-architect it and that's fine some of those system upgrades and, pa and pause projects can no longer wait anymore they have to be processed they have to we have to make sure we're progressing with those and the council is still facing as many councils are financial challenges in the future years um, and that's really where we are at the moment my my reflection on all this is we've done three years of transition in my view in one year it's been a fantastic achievement and i've been so proud of the team and the council and the way everybody has pulled together to respond to this and you know, the work we've done in the past over the last three years around digitalization and, and paperless in particular and you know we were fortunate enough to win a, a paperless award back in 2018 those have been so important to help grease the wheels of our organization to keep people working to keep people moving to keep people safe on the front line and those building blocks that we've put in place now mean we can move forward as as a and adapt as a smarter working organization thank you i'll pass over to robert Thank you, Phil. Uh, my name's Councillor Robert Jandy, Cabinet Member for Organisational Excellence from Swindon Borough Council. As Phil said, what a year. I've seen so many different changes and coming from an environment which is actually triple-hatted, so I've seen things from the parish side and from the charity side. The first year was, first phase was really about people coming together and actually trying to work together to solve these issues. There have been many things, many aspects to look at in terms of home working, which was previously seen as almost a luxury and is now the norm, and bring into that homeschooling. And what actually what came out of it was that, yes, we are on the same sort of trip, the same river, but everyone's in a different boat. Everyone's got different experiences. And so it's actually bringing that all together and that understanding. So the whole area of mental well-being um, was core at the work. So it's not only the mental health of our staff, but of the residents as well, to ensure everyone felt safe. The services were being supplied at the correct standards that people were used to but actually from that it's actually brought out new ways of working and actually new ways of thinking what was the norm in the past suddenly has been challenged and there are, we can think about let's do this a little bit differently how can we do that is there a way of improving it and the thing i've seen is people becoming a little bit more creative and actually looking at things in different ways and coming up and actually standing up and saying these are these are you know, these are the alternatives that we can look at. And I've been so proud of that. If I was looking at, say, from the charity side, you had people had, had no thoughts or actually uh, inclination of using IT. And suddenly they are put in the situation, you either do this or nothing. And people have flown. People have become experts in social media, in various ways of communicating through IT, and actually finding different ways of trying to supplement what would be the norm in an office environment. So 
even within Swinburne Borough Council. They were, they were looking at alternatives at the, the water cooler where people could actually discuss things. So no one would, felt, would actually felt disconnected. And if you actually look at the, the communication and collaborative survey, it actually pointed out that 82% of staff see uh, mental well-being as, as the first priority in all of this. So that was really the first phase. Everyone was in this together. But then the coming back to work was the next issue. It wasn't a case of, oh, we can drop everything, everything returns back to normal. No. It was a case of people have got so used to working in this new environment, people actually required more help and assistance to bring them back in. So we had the, the mental fitness people involved, people trained up to actually help people go through this process, identifying of issues, making sure that the whole issue of social distancing and safety was in place in the offices themselves. So everyone was, could feel safe. But there was also um, the recognition that not everyone wanted to come in or could go, go back in. So they were helped out as well. So it was almost a, a flip side to how phase one happened. And slowly, as we sort of settled back in, we came into the second phase. And again, it was the processes, the techniques were all there things came out of the lessons learned and there was a better understanding of how things worked and so it was almost like turning a key and the next phase could happen but you can't do that with human beings they were, they were completely different we what we've actually seen is a, a greater need and support of the individual to actually now work in this um back to this uh lock, lockdown environment and mental well-being has become even more important to actually support people. The novelty has worn off. And now people are realizing the actual situation that they're in. So actually working a little bit more on that side. Long going, it's, it's the benefits out of all of this. I think it's actually brought out, we can actually do things differently. We can do things better than before. Um, the team at Swinburne Council has been amazing. Everyone's really come up with new ideas, new instances, and really worked hard to ensure the quality of service was there. But at the same time, at the core, it was the, the safety of the staff and the residents. And I've been so proud to be involved with that. What does the future hold? I think we've learned so much, we can't really go back because we've actually seen benefits from what we've learned to actually make, make the whole process and the whole system even better than it was before. So it's a case of watch this space. I'll pass you back to Mark. Thank you, Phil and Robert for that insight. Uh, before I hand over to our fifth and final speaker, uh, Raj Mack at Birmingham City Council on, uh, on their journey uh, throughout the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, just a quick reminder, uh, to keep your questions and comments coming in and we'll try and get to as many of those as possible uh, later on. Uh, but in the interim, I'm now going to hand over to Raj. Are you there? Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Raj Mark. I'm Head of Business Engagement at Birmingham City Council. Um, I'm working in the, the IT and digital services section. Uh, as most of you are aware, Birmingham is probably one of the largest local authorities in the UK and uh, no doubt we have faced many of the challenges that other local authorities have faced since we've had lockdown. New challenges, new opportunities as well as a result of COVID, uh, but clearly given our size, you can imagine some of the challenges that we had were probably <laughs> 10 times many, more than many of the other local authorities faced. But, Certainly looking and working with other local authorities, we certainly learned a lot from them. And throughout this whole approach around COVID, one of the key things that we did do was make sure that we didn't try and do anything in isolation. We reached out to other local authorities. We tried to get an understanding of some of the things they were doing. We made sure we learned from some of their lessons and made sure that whatever we did, we shared with others as well. So just looking at some of the things that happened as a result of the first COVID, and some of the things that we did to make sure our staff were safe and their well-being was at the heart of everything we did. 
one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that all our staff had the right tools to be able to do the jobs. I think one of the so one of our greatest successes in Birmingham was that we were able to almost seamlessly continue with all our services without a break when lockdown hit the first lockdown hit. It took a massive effort to ensure that all our staff had the right equipment. So we had a massive rollout of new uh, laptops to all our staff. I think we went from the state around 2000 laptops to around 7,000 to 9,000 laptops in the end. We bought brand new licenses to ensure that staff could access corporate services. We set up an IT hub that enabled staff to have a place where they can take um, broken equipment or questions they could feel or have any issues and problems with their devices they're in. All those things were put in place really, really rapidly to ensure we could make sure our staff had the support they needed. But one of the things that we did make sure is that staff felt comfortable in doing what they did. So when staff were offered the opportunity to work at home, we put in processes to ensure that they weren't isolated in any way. And that involved both formal activities as well as informal activities. And, that, and I'd like to say some of the informal activities we did with staff probably helped them settle in and feel much more connected to their work colleagues and made sure that they had a good understanding of what was going on corporately and what the role was whilst they were working at home. So certainly, and this is where staff really sort of showed how resilient they were. A lot of them and a lot of our teams put together informal sessions, socialising sessions where we would regularly make time uh, for that staff to just be able to talk about some of the things they're doing, non-work related, sharing their hobbies, sharing activities they're doing and making sure they had that relief. Because uh, for, for many, it was the first time they were working from home. Many of them didn't have the right environmental setup at home. They didn't have extra bedrooms, for example, or extra tables to sit at. So we tried to make their environment as comfortable as possible to be able to do those things. So on the social side, we made sure that our staff, as I said, um, had that space and the time, not just to concentrate on work, but concentrate on social activities. And we even introduced wellbeing sessions, sometimes even yoga sessions, and, and staff to lead some of these sessions so they felt that they were part of it. We also made sure that internally, those staff that really did find it difficult to work at home, we tried to look at alternatives for them, create a Space within the offices in a, in a social distancing way with the right tools to enable them to work from home and also work from work if they really needed or provide an alternative place for them to work just to ensure that they didn't feel that they were isolated and they weren't being listened to and we thought those type of activities were really important just from a staff, staff well-being uh, opportunity for them and making sure that they had the right facilities and the support that they needed to be able to do those things. And the, the, the success or the, the outcome was very, very good. What we realised from our staff was, I mean, we used to have less than 10% of our staff working at home. Suddenly we had, you know, about 90% of our staff working from home, all accessing systems. And the work that we did to ensure our, the, our infrastructure uh, was resilient enough to be able to do that made sure the devices had the right setup and the software to enable them to connect. And to some extent, we were very lucky that we were just coming off uh, a major rollout of um, Office 365 across the organization. And, and this was a real opportunity for staff to use these new tools environment that we were putting in. And we, like many other authorities, had a plan of taking a number of years to make sure staff were comfortable with the tools, had the right training to be able to do activities and use the whole suite of activities in a much more effective way. And really it was such a huge learning curve for them. Most of our staff picked up the tools quite readily. Most were happy to start looking at ways of, different ways of working from home and looking to see how they could collaborate much more effectively using online tools, which was a great revelation to us. And, and again, like many other authorities, I think what we thought we would achieve in four to five years, we achieved in the space of a month, a month, uh, a few months to enable us to be able to do that much more effectively. One of the things that we did do, and I mentioned it earlier, was set up a, an IT hub uh, in one of our core buildings. It was a 20 and it operated 24 seven in the early days of the lockdown to provide staff 
with the confidence that there is someone there for them to listen to, someone there that will support them if they had a problem, and there was someone there to be able to fix those problems for them. And that was a, a great, uh, great success and enabled us to continue to roll out our services really effectively. But we also did put in a lot of formal activities to support staff as well. I mean, clearly uh, support from uh, places like the Occupational Health uh, Organization, some of our chaplaincy services were available to ensure they both had that informal support as well as a formal support to support them uh, through the lockdown. And I must say, the sort of the feedback that we had from staff, we found that productivity got up, which was a, a huge revelation for us. We found that a lot of people actually enjoyed working from home. And as a result of that, uh, having that flexibility to work, um, you know, at a time that suits them. And we were very flexible that way. We didn't set up rigid hours. We didn't put in processes that ensure that people are always working from nine to five. We gave people the opportunity to have that level of flexibility. And as a result, uh, productivity certainly went, down, went up uh, quite considerably. And uh, that was, and, and in similar ways, our sickness levels over that period were amazingly low. Uh, we had fewer levels of sickness than we've ever had for a very long time. And I think that uh, was a testament to the resilience of our staff and, and really the flexibility they enjoyed as a result of that. So that was some of the things that we did to actually support our staff to, to make sure their well-being was looked after and to encourage them to work uh, in a way that they felt were really more effective for them. And, and moving forward, what we are constantly doing is looking at how we are exploring new ways of working. We've actually set up a new working stream across the organisation called New Ways of Working where we're exploring a no, number of different types of activities across so clearly devices, making sure people have the right devices. And that includes looking at the whole concept of setting up either an office in, the, in their home or an office at, at workplace or at a different locality. The whole uh, strategy and policy around this is looking at different ways of working and how we can potentially minimize our property port portfolio and look to give people the option of working in different ways at different locations or locations that they choose and making sure that they have that confidence and the, the support to be able to choose those locations and feel comfortable in those locations. In some cases, just to support them, we have, we have seen a huge change in the way people actually work. We used to have huge amounts of paper being printed out all over the place. Uh, lots of printers, a lot of that comes to a standstill. Um, most people are doing things online. They're working more effectively online. Our print budget has gone um, completely uh, dropped and, and there's hardly that much of a print budget there. Where we have had to have services where um, printing has been necessary, we've even made the effort to ensure that we've installed printers in the home to give people that confidence that they have the right tools to work from. Moving forward, um, we are exploring different ways of working. We've even ensured that uh, staff have secondary monitors to take with them if they need to. If there's those parts of staff that to need that kind of capabilities. And we've even ensured that, you know, um, we've made our office furniture available to many staff as well. So four nice chairs from work have gone out to localities within the home for them to use. So we've tried to do everything we can to try and support those, uh, those staff at home as much as we can. To ensure that staff, uh, when we did come back to them, what we have done is made sure that uh, we've set up and created a new app uh, so that enables staff to be able to book themselves into the office. So what we want to do is give those staff that really want to come back in the option to come back in, but in a safe and social distance environment. So we set up um, an online app and able to people to book a desk uh, throughout the building and really change our whole concept of uh, people having a desk of their own or getting used to sitting in a place where they got used to the, the desk environment, the booking app identified a place, a desk that they would be able to book, uh, work as a workstation for a limited period in a socially distant way and then that desk would be cleaned, tidied up the next day for somebody else to use. So change the whole um, way of approaching uh, the office environment 
people working really fluidly and flexibly across the organization is one of the things that we managed to achieve with this app and that is still being used now for us to be able to monitor manage and, and control people coming in or who really feel that they need to come in in, in a safe environment Moving forward again as part of the sort of new ways of working, we've recognized that uh, some of our devices and equipment might not be resilient enough or modern enough for staff to be able to use more effectively. So we've invested in trying to ensure that all our new laptops and replacing old laptops that didn't have cameras. So we ensure that all our new laptops have had cameras now. Uh, so that people can talk face to face, have that face to look at rather than just a blank screen to look at, which has enabled people to have more personalized conversations and feel more engaged in some of the things they do and enable us to work together. One of the things that we did notice was a potential barrier for us and did cause potential problems starting off was working with external partners. Clearly, we as a council had the right tools in place to be able to do that collaborative working. But what we've noticed is a lot of our partners had different types of platform communication platforms. Some of us weren't compatible with our systems. Some of our systems weren't compatible with them. And really, those early days of joint partnership working was quite difficult. And, and finding a platform that everybody could collaborate on was an issue. And I'm glad to say that work with external partners we have worked with them we've explored the type of platforms they use looked at the platforms we use and come to a consensus about what are our unified approach on platforms what is a unified communications tool that we need and we're working with our external partners to be able to develop those to ensure that we all have a common understanding of what are the right tools for us to have to work and collaborate, collaborate more most effectively Certainly, innovation has now uh, become much more important in the organisation. Birmingham is always looking at new ways of working as part of this, and we have had uh, pilots around things like robotics and RPA in the past. And what we are now seeing is a resurgence of that more of the directorates and our um, the service areas that we're working with, looking at technology for them to be able to look at how they can automate a lot more services. We've worked with our adult social care to look at different ways that we can minimize um, staff having to go out and looking at how different technologies can support more remote working and enable staff to work in a more safe environment, but also give our citizens the confidence to use some of the tools that we have. The other big growth area for us has been around data. Now, data has been so important in understanding where COVID is, how we are supporting our most vulnerable, where those vulnerable are, and the types of tools and interventions we need to make to, you know, to support some of those things. So data has been extremely important and we are developing almost a data as a service approach where we're looking to set up more intelligence around how effectively we can use data, creating a data warehouse capability that we can bring our different types of data from across the council together so we can more effective use of it but also looking to see how we work with external partners and their data to make sure that we can look at Birmingham as a whole and not just look at the areas that are supported by the council, but look to see how we can support the city through different types of services and moving forward. So those are just some of the things that we're trying to do in Birmingham. It is a, a journey that we are continuously developing. We know it will not be the, the old norm. This will be a new norm moving forward. We will work in a different way. We, coming back to the office uh, isn't going to be what we do in the future. We know that's not going to happen. So we are putting in place new processes, new, play, new, new systems that enable us to work, work, work more remotely. We will be looking at options of creating locality hubs that enable people to work in different places. They may be closer to them and more easy for them to get to and enable them to work in a safe environment. Uh, and we're also going to give, look at more options for people to continue to work at home in, in a way that suits them and suits their lifestyle, hopefully making the local authority a much more attractive place to work, given the level of flexibility we can offer them. So that's some of the things that we are beginning to do. It's a journey that will continue for a while. Uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, from some of the work that we come in, we will learn from other local authorities, but also uh, help show different ways of activities that we're doing to support them.
Thank you. Thank you, Raj. And uh, thank you to all of our speakers uh, for today's uh, sharing and, uh, and, and learning exchange. We're, um, wow, what a, what a uh, perspective on uh, all different kinds of ways of looking at uh, the transformation that uh, local authorities are going through. Um, I'm now going to move on to our uh, Q&A. Um, we've had uh, numerous comments and questions already come in. Um, but uh, yeah, any any uh, comments, questions you still may have, feel free to, to uh, pop those across to us and we'll try and get to as many as possible in this next section. Um, so let's start with the Q&A. Okay, Gareth, I've got one for you here. Our councils have a great deal of challenges uh, contend to contend with right now, both internally to support employees, externally to care for citizens and all under extreme financial restraints. What, in your opinion, is the most important, important aspect of digital technology that we cannot afford to get wrong? Thanks for that, Mark. Um, great question to, to lead in with there. Um, I'll probably look at this in two aspects. Um, so firstly, experience and then the second around infrastructure. So just uh, bear with me a second. Um, I think the first one is, and in some respects this goes without saying, but really has to be um, you know, seriously embraced, is providing a great user experience. And that's gonna be across all users, be they internal or external. Uh, and and yeah, as Joe was talking about uh, a little bit earlier, you know, the pivot that Thanet had to do in terms of making sure that their website was providing the right information to citizens. So you know, that is, is absolutely kind of part, you know, you know, can't be understated or even overstated that that user experience has got to be first and foremost. Um, on the infrastructure side, well, this past year really has demonstrated, you know, the benefits of, of deploying uh, your cloud-based services. Uh, and so I think that cloud first, you know, in line with those strategies that have been around for a long time, is, found in, is absolutely a foundational element to get right. Um, and again, during the team at Thanet, they, they set this all out to kind of do that. So I think that those two aspects, experience and infrastructure, and, in, and as far as infrastructure is concerned, really embracing cloud you know they are the, the key things that you know we can't afford to get wrong that's great thanks joe i've got one for you here what are your predictions for how local government should use digital technology in the future does this reflect any trends found in uh, the research that we've done and what strategies principles will your council look to develop okay so um that's a really good question. I think going back and reverse on the principles, I think every local council is is pretty hard up um, for cash at the moment. And uh, as I've mentioned multiple times before, we are quite a poor council. So I think for us, one of the biggest principles that we have in our digital things is reuse and improve. And it's about using technology better. I find that it's not necessarily about what technology you choose it's more necessarily getting people to use it and training them to understand it better and using it to its full potential um, we've used lots of different free technology and i think that's that's again something that we do is reuse or or use open source technology so that we can um save money um, yeah, I think that's the big thing for local governments is that they need to kind of reinvest in the technology they have and not always look to replace the current technology just to keep reusing and improving what they have and keep expanding on it. OK, great. Thank you. So we've got a question here. I'm going to put this to uh, you, Phil, at, uh, at Swindon. Uh, you mentioned uh, how much progress you were uh, uh, making on implement, implementing new emerging technologies during the pandemic. Uh, has the council experienced any notable barriers uh, during this period? Um, the, I suppose um, the notable barriers um, that we uh, 
we have experienced as part of the pandemic is just the ability to to bring lots of staff together i think all the services as you know the sort of key to a successful project is to bring together the people who are affected by the services so our frontline staff in particular and i think that's been a challenge as they've been juggling so so many demands i, th I think getting hold of their time and, and their prioritization has been challenging they are they have to really prioritize where their effort in and and you know in an ideal world we'd have a lot more of their time to help create this perfect project um, and I think that's been the biggest challenge. Okay great thank you. So I've got a question here for uh, Councillor Jandy. Um, has there been notable differences between how Swindon Council has supported their employees during the different phases of Covid and what areas of support will remain in post uh, once we come to an end of the pandemic? I think in terms of support, there's been an additional amount on the mental well-being aspect. So people have been trained up to support individuals, whether they've, um, they're still ill or whether they're actually returning back to work. But it's something I think it's going to be ongoing. It's not something which is going to be solved overnight. And we, this is something that you know, we're going through the very first time. So we're not sure what the long term mental health applications uh, implications are going to be and I think it's something we've got to keep on monitoring. That's great thank you. So we've got a question that's come in uh, Raj I'm going to put this uh, one to you can you expand on some of the ways that you and the council have supported staff to obtain new digital skills? Yes thanks Mark. Yes I mean one of the things that we recognised is we were able to roll out devices, we were able to roll out equipment to enable people to work from home. But one thing we wanted to do was make sure they had the right skills, the training, uh, and the ability to make most of the tools that they had. So we recognised that we couldn't use the old ways of working, we couldn't do classroom training as we did in the past with some of our major systems, that we had to look at different ways of doing this. And we explored a number of ways we, we looked at placing uh, you know, manuals online, we put the, looked at uh, doing um, procedures and flowcharts online. But what we found, and we even created, sorry, we even created a, a modern workplace hub where we brought together some of the training material that we had in, in a place where staff could work with. We already created a, a network of advocates across the organisation to start looking at some of the tooling who were embedded with the organisation to do that. Clearly, when lockdown came, a lot of that infrastructure disappeared overnight. So we had to explore different ways of doing this. And one of the things that we did do, and taking feedback from staff, a lot of staff didn't want to read manuals, they didn't have the time, they didn't understand some of those things. It was quite laborious. And what they asked for was live team sessions. So we started doing sessions, lunchtime sessions, sessions on activities and problems that staff were having issues with. We even started doing small videos, vid videoettes, uh, if you want to call them, just to give people a, a little bite-sized videos of activities they could do, which they could cons consume easily in a time-effective way, and that would teach them how to do it on a step-by-step -step way of actually doing things in a different way. And what we found is the satisfaction with training, with the feedback we had, was, was quite good. Uh, a lot of people really enjoyed that, and they found it really easy to pick up uh, those type of skills. So that's one of the ways we started doing training and making sure our staff felt comfortable with the tools that they had. That's great. Did that um, help particularly with things like Zoom fatigue as well? Yes, I mean, um, <laughs> using um, Teams and online platforms was, was a bit of an issue, but by using these tools, it enabled people to use them much more effectively, understand how to use them, understand how to make the most of them. So yes, it, it certainly helped that because it enabled people to look at the training at the time when it suited them uh, and when they needed a break, they could actually look at these things rather than being forced to look at a video or forced to look at a Zoom call or a, uh, a particular stream constantly at a time that was not convenient for them. Okay, great, thank you. So we've got a question here that's uh, touched on uh, using uh, AI and automation. Uh, in in a, a citizen and customer facing roles, uh, how how and has this been successful? And how do you see the council using AI and automation into the future? Is that one that you can cover, cover Phil? 
Um, that might be one for Councillor Jandy, I think, just in terms of kind of customer services, and may maybe that might be a good perspective, Councillor Jandy. If you're okay. comfortable with that. Yes, go on. Sorry, could you just um, repeat the question, please? Uh, so it was talking about AI and automation uh, for the use in customer services. Has this been successful and how do you see councils using AI and automation into the future? I think it has to be used carefully and in the right environment. It's one of those areas where if you have a very simple um, service where you're going for a selection process and it's just a binary yes or no situation, then yes, AI is absolutely brilliant for that. And I think it's something we can further look at and actually look at potential areas of actually releasing staff from the more mundane um, work jobs to something a little bit more upskilled from that, from that perspective. So yes, it's definitely the way forward. That's great, thanks. Joe, I've got one here for you. How do you see your council and others of a similar size dealing with the transition back to the office? Uh, what key elements of this period of change and transformation will you hold on to in the future and why? So for, for us, I think in local governments, I think there's going to be maybe three types of local governments. So I think they're going to be the people that have said, well, we're glad that's over and we're back in the office as normal. Um, there's going to be the kind of more hybrid that's like you can come back in the office but you can also work from home and there's going to be the local councils that realize that actually we don't need a massive office anymore and the public sector and the private sector have been working from home for a long time um maybe that's that's the that's the change i think as a council for us we're going to be somewhere in the middle again hybrid but one of the things that we're definitely going to take away from this is is video calling, um, is streaming to the internet our uh, meetings, and we're definitely going to continue that uh, collaboration, working on Google Documents more, um, rather than in silos, creating one document and then sharing it once it's finished, maybe sharing it once you've got a straw outline of, of, of what's in there with the people that are going to be filling it out and then you can all collaborate on it. And I think that's what we've kind of reinforced through this is that we can collaborate, we can work remotely um, and we don't have to be physically in one office. That's great, thanks. Gareth, another one for you. In your opinion, and having worked with councils large and small across the UK uh, to develop their digital communication strategies, what would you say is often the biggest barrier in progressing an organisation's unified comms journey? Um, what fundamental steps can we as councils take to make our next project a success? Uh, over to you. Oh, that's another good question. Um, so from the most successful projects that I've been involved with uh, over my career, I'll probably highlight two elements um, you know, to ensuring success. Uh, and you could look at them from an opposite view as, as being barriers. Um, so the first one is around clarity of communications out to, you know, out to people. So what is it in terms of you know, this unified comms uh, your project solution. You know, why are we implementing it? You know, what's the what's the benefit that we're going to get from it? And um, there's an aspect there around how will it make my life better? Yeah, you know, and in some respects, you know, that's coming back to the addressing the well, what's in it for me? Yeah, you know, why do I need to kind of embrace and change it? Um, and then also the how will it help our customers? Now, all of these elements should kind of layer up to be to to help to give a a, a view of well, how is it going to fit into our wider organisation? Uh, the objectives that we have, strategic plans, and so on. Um, so it's really showing all those interconnected parts, making sure that the clarity of communication around those back to people so that they understand ultimately why we're doing it, what the benefits are going to be. Um, and then the second aspect is around ensuring organization-wide support. So this shouldn't be something which is an IT project with maybe a little bit of senior leadership support. Um, building a network of champions across the organization and that then being advocates for you know the solution or the technology that's been deployed and this applies to uc or any kind of transformation project is is absolutely you know key to to help in some respects you're capturing the early adopters that they'll always be for any kind of technology change 
But what you're really looking for them to do is is help to create the pull um, across the mass user space, you know, to help them to to get to um, adopt uh, and really embrace the solution. Um, and then you're kind of left with the you know the uh, the trailing aspects, the the laggards, and you know, the the ones who are uh, you know more slow to adopt. But again, you know, with, with having both your early adopters and the mass user base, hopefully you can kind of pull them um, along with you, you know, relatively quickly. So again. Firstly, clarity of communication, you know, why are we doing this? And then the other aspect is ensuring organization-wide support. Thank you, Gareth. So I've got a question here I'm going to put to you, Raj. Uh, you talked about how much the council's done in terms of uh, providing the necessary equipment and, and tools uh, for your uh, remote workforce now uh, and home workers uh, in terms of new laptops and, and things like that. How much transformation um, and how much has the pandemic expedited your uh, movement to the cloud and other areas of digital transformation in terms of uh, cloud and emerging technology? It's hugely, and it really is supportive of some of the work that we'd already been doing. So we'd already had a program activity that the council was uh, investing in uh, called the Application Modernization Platform, where we were reviewing all our applications we've already got to move away from um, some of our own data previous data centers that were with different organizations to move them into our own data centers so we've already had a project like that on ongoing and we were already in the process of reviewing all of our applications i think we had something like 400 500 applications across the estate and what this program was doing was both looking at the number of applications we had but also looking to see which of these applications could be moved to the cloud. So what we have found is a lot of our old applications, on-premise applications, have now moved onto the cloud, and a lot of our estate has moved to a hybrid cloud basis, which has enabled us to be much more effective uh, and enable our staff to work from anywhere, any place basis. Right, that's great. I'm guessing that's why that's led you on now to looking at well, what data virtualization and all these fundamental uh, sources of data in all these different applications. Absolutely, so it is a massive opportunity for us to explore how we can use data much more effectively, being able to access services in a different way, to access and start developing insights into what we need to be doing in a different way moving forward. All right, well, our, our research with Ring Central uh, revealed that there's still quite a lot of, well, remains a lack of confidence around things like security in the cloud. Um, what, what are your views on that at a local government level? Uh, I think there is uh, you know, some concern, local authority, cyber attacks on local authorities are quite prevalent. And, and certainly during the pandemic, it was something that we were aware that uh, certainly as an organization, there, there may be causes of issues. And, and again, it is something that we have been developing. We, we have developed a, a brand new cyber security strategy, one that re reflects the changing dynamics of our infrastructure, looking at how and what we need to do differently with the onset and increase in cloud-based applications. So it is something that we've picked up. That strategy is going through approval processes now, and it is quite a substantial amount of investment we're making in our cloud deployment and security deployments around that capability. That's great, thank you. So Phil, we've got a question here again about emerging technology, seems to be a particular pertinent point in the, uh, in the Q and A. Uh, what features or uses of emerging technology will you use uh, permanently post COVID and what factors le have led Swinning Council to probably come to this decision? I think some of the technologies we will be particularly more interested in exploring going forward are very much the robotic process automation type processes to free up uh, free up uh, critical resources to help help um, target them in the best possible way. That will be an ongoing program of work. We're seeing a lot of use cases coming out from the pandemic around how data could in particular be used to better better respond to these sorts of things in the future and I see a lot of technology advances in the field of data that we're very interested in exploring. Um, 
I think also there's something for us to take forward in terms of, and we're actively exploring the use of sensors, uh, particularly around the climate emergency and the climate change and how we can help support that going forward. Uh, I think that's it's very topical at the moment and, um, and emerging technology has a big role to play in that space. That's great, thanks. Uh, looking at the time here, I think we'll now need to bring a close to today's learning exchange. Um, Apologies to those delegates that we've not had a chance to uh, get a response to their questions and, and comments covered. Uh, there's still quite a lot to go through and we could be here for at least another hour doing so. Um, we will ensure our speakers pick these up and come back to you directly. Um, I hope you have all found today uh, uh, fascinating in terms of the experiences of the uh, different speakers. Uh, as well as what each of us have all got in common, uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for sharing their journeys. And on behalf of the uh, Gov News team and our uh, partners at Ring Central, I'd also like to express our appreciation for your attendance uh, at this online event. Um, we, we do trust that you found it insightful and of benefit uh, for, for your own journey. Um, I'd like to wish you all a great day. Uh, stay safe and hope to see you again at a future event with us. Thank you very much.